Hey everyone, welcome to the Good E Reader Radio Show. My name is Michael. And Peter's sitting over here. What is going on? Um, well, I've been noticing in the last month or two, there's been a large number of new devices being <laughs> announced or released. Like, Hasn't it? Like Tolino, uh, you know, the Shine, God, the new yeah, one, the, yeah. the Kindle Basic, the Kindle Scribes coming out soon. Um, all sorts of new devices from like Onyx. It's, yeah. You know, even going into 2023, there's a ton of different devices oh, coming out. Uh, yeah. Including... Oh, the Hanvon uh, N10 just got announced. The the mini uh, note taker there. Yeah, it's like it's just when you think like everything's kind of announced and released. The, every single week, there's like yeah. all sorts of new devices coming yeah. out with like. And then once we're like, paper. okay, it's it's done, done, done. And then it's like Fossil Gen 6, and it's like, ah, oh, <laughs> another one. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, let's talk about things. Yeah, uh, let's talk about things. Big Me gal- Galley. That's probably the biggest thing, honestly, uh, is um, Big Me releasing Gallery 3 note-taking. And why that is is because up until now, other than the one-off WeWood group, which is, you know, the re-inkstone top joy, which is still questionable to this day, no one has ever released something with an e-paper alternative in a consumer form. There's been a couple things, the Kyobo of early yawn, and there's been uh, the the high high sense Q5 that was like RLCD, but no one's really released like uh, an e-ink alternative product. Like, you know, e-ink uh, Kaleido is the color, and there's e-ink Spectra, which is used for like, you know, McDonald's menu signs, and then e-ink gallery. And like, no one's employed that into a consumer product, but Big Me has. Yeah, so there's a bit of a timeline with this. So Gallery 3 is using the e-ink advanced color e-paper, which was used for like digital signage, like for the past five years. But e-ink made a concentrated effort to use this and have it compatible with you know, e-readers, e-notes, but make the refresh rate respectable because That's advanced color thing. e-paper one of the drawbacks is like it's like 20 seconds for you're right things to change now it's like milliseconds that was the biggest thing honestly when you look at the alternatives like spectra which takes like 20 seconds to a minute and then you look at things like gallery which took like you know nine seconds you couldn't justify anything outside of regular you know ian carta ian kaleido because it's just so fast but now that they're starting to over cross each other and play on the same playing field we see alternatives coming out okay so let let's talk about what big me is doing with the galley it's an yeah. eight inch color e-note that's using gallery three color e-paper it will be able to display over fifty thousand colors and the drawing experience will be unrivaled it That's will be insane. able to read and edit PDF files in full color, in addition to comics and magazines. Yeah. The hardware specs are out of the out of this world, and it also has dual cameras with OCR technology. So this will be the first commercially viable Gallery Three product ever. It's very exciting. It will mm. retail for six ninety nine, and will come out in January twenty twenty three. You can pre order it right now from the Goody Reader store by going to goodyreader.com slash blog slash yeah. shop. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about how that uh, well, some funny things about it. Uh, I remember Mike and his team um, half a month ago set up a meeting with uh, our Japan office. So me spearheading the Japan office. I went to a, a meeting with E Inc. And they showed off the Sharp 8 Gallery 3 E-Note. And I was like, whoa, this is the first uh, we're ever hearing about this. And that was on October 18th. Literally one day later, on October 19th, Big Me approached us and said, hey guys, do you guys want to collaborate on something? And we're like, uh, yeah, what, what's going on? And they said, do you want to collaborate on a galley, uh, a gallery device? And we're like, oh, 
<laughs> wait a minute <laughs> how did you know about it like it just got announced like nine hours ago when we went to the trade show so um it was a crazy set of timelines so like now that there's multiple players including sharp which is like a mega conglomerate in the world they make tvs and radios and flashlights they make everything um now there's more you can see that all of a sudden there's literally multiple players in the game who are making ga uh, gallery devices so like I, I, at first, for a split second, my head was like, yeah, yeah, gallery in a note-taking form is not going to take off. That's like a pipe dream. No, it's other companies are employing it already. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that I like about the Big Me Galley is that the color resolution will be 300 ppi. That's so, right. So, uh, you know, this is really achieved through... Um, Per, you know a full color gamut for each pixel so that's how you're able to have you know it being better than Kaleido 3 basically which is weird because they also when we went to the meeting announced Kaleido 3 and I actually saw that first you can see the timeline of the uploads when we saw that we were like oh cool Kaleido 3 oh you're gonna get Fujitsu as a as a client or like yeah and we're like okay wow this is big stuff then they gave us a little curveball and they said we're not for sure yet, but currently the way the color technology works is that the PPI, if you have 300 PPI, it actually gets divided by three. So a third of the black and white PPI is the color PPI. And I was like, oh, that's that's kind of a huge drawback right now, because that means it's only 100, 100 PPI on the color. And what happens if you have a 212 PPI 13 inch and they're like yeah it'd be like 70 <laughs> and i was like oh okay so they said they're gonna work on things and fix it but it's interesting to see this shift how the next generation kaleido came out it's compatible with comfort gaze and then they're like oh yeah there's a huge drawback to the tech so you know we're just like okay this is this is interesting gallery's coming up and kaleido's going down if anything yeah i mean it all depends on the refresh rate i know with gallery 3 tech E Ink has a bunch of different refresh op options yeah. that work on like the hardware level. So I believe that you could control it with software. So mm -hmm. that's how Big Me is doing like different speed modes with this in order mm -hmm. to control the refresh rate of like the color. Because, you know, colors, cal color in Gallery 3, it's unrivaled. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? And compared to like any other color e paper tech that we've ever seen. So how does this like work in the real world you know that's the that's the million dollar question i mean the tech is there you know it's yeah. running an octa-core processor six gigs of ram yeah. 120 gigs of internal storage sd card with an additional 128 gigs of storage that's, yeah you know 4000 milliamp um you know wacom screen so it works with like the big me pen it also works with like various other pens so you know, Android 11 with Google Play pre-installed. So the, you know, the Big Me Galley looks like on paper, everything that someone would need to have a very robust color experience. But, you know, without us actually reviewing it yet, or even actually seeing this like in person, you know, how many colors will be on the drawing app remains to be unseen. Yeah. How would the refresh rate work with various speed modes when it comes to web browsing, playing games, uh, you know, editing PDFs, how what's the page turn speed like in ebooks? You know, all unknowns. You know, e ink standard carta screens, the ones that are on everything, you know what I mean? The 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 Kindle, the Kobo, the Onyx they're all really fast and they're tried and tested and i mean hisense is is a no better example of being like the fastest refresh of any e-ink product almost and then you see the other alternatives like gallery and spectra and traditionally they look better but like mike said there's all these technical drawbacks and like these logistical hindrances so like what's gonna be the drawback is it gonna be like oh note taking's great but it can't like pinch and zoom you know what i mean it has trouble changing state like what's gonna be the thing that is gonna it has there has to be a negative because if it's just so good 
out of the gates that big me and sharp and who knows what other players are going to grab it why would anyone use kaleido anymore you know what i mean like we really and and this is just speculation like you know just we're talking here but like why would people use an inferior technology that has like a ppi uh you know a drawback and like you know the colors aren't as vibrant and like why would anyone use it so this is all stuff that's going to be revealed to us when we start getting samples well when it comes to kaleido at least kaleido one and two has a strong track record with companies using oh, for this sure. technology for commercial viable products yes Whereas you're right there's no commercial viable products of gallery three at all so that's why when, when i was yeah when i was on the trade show floor i got to play with the sharp the only thing I could see was, yeah, the, the refresh was slower, but all, all the guys were telling me, you know, all the guys were like, oh yeah, it's going to be fixed. It's going to be fixed. Don't worry. Don't worry. Cause you know, they want to put their best foot forward. Right? They don't want us playing with an inferior product. So they kept saying like standing over our shoulder with their hands linked behind their back, their little, you know, ID tag hanging from their neck. They're just like, oh yeah, don't worry about that. Like when I touched it, they're like, oh, don't worry. It's going to be fixed. And I'm just like, okay, well, it's just going to be the best thing ever. I'm sorry. Yeah. So it was, it was pretty funny. Um, they said they're going to fix everything. I don't know. We don't know. We have to get some physical samples to really know. All right. So let's talk about the Fujitsu screens that we saw. Yeah. Um, so he here's what we know right now. Uh, Linfini, which basically develops the screens that Fujitsu uses yeah. in the Quadrino line. The first generation, the second generation, and the upcoming third generation that should be released sometime in spring of uh, 2023. We know that it's using an Ian Carta 1250 display panel, which is the same one that the second generation uh, employed when it came yeah. out in 2021. Basically, you get all the advantages of Carta 1200 found in many of the popular e-readers of the world, such as the Kindle Paperwhite, the Kindle Sage, so you get about 20% increase in performance, about 35% increase in page turn speed for both eBooks and PDFs. But 1250 also includes improved pen latency. So it's more responsive when yeah. putting pen to the screen. So with the upcoming third generation Fujitsu Quadrono A4, it's gonna have a resolution of 1250 by 1920 at 240. 40 PPI. The second generation model only had 1650 by 2200 at 227 PPI. So just with the black and white screen, there is a dramatic resolution increase, which is really nice. Yeah. So that on its own will be good. Um, so, you know, like Peter said about the, the color resolution, the color PPI on this 13.3 inch a4 will only be 80 ppi yeah yeah that's a big drawback and unlike a kaleido 2 or kaleido plus where there isn't that limitation of having a stark difference between the initial ppi and the color there is currently that trade-off with k3 as they're calling it but I mean, we've never seen uh, a 13.3 inch using Kaleido before. Oh, dude, we've never seen a 13.3 inch using color before. It wouldn't matter. People have been lining up at the metaphorical gates for a 13.3 inch color. I don't think it matters who releases what with what tech. People want it. People need it. It's been a constant topic of discussion. I don't think, without exaggerating, I don't think a day has gone by without our corporation getting at least one question, concern, comment about, is there a 13.3 inch with color? Like, I know you at the news publication, when you're talking everyone, they always ask, uh, when we do their YouTube videos and lives, people always ask, it's an, it's a, it's thing, it's, they need it. So uh, I think trade backs as trade offs aside, people are gonna want it, man. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to the previous generation Kaleido, We've really kind of seen it on all sorts of devices from like phones yeah. to e-readers to e-notes using like a 10.3 inch screen. I mean, the even the Bing Me uh, slash Goody Reader ink note color uses yep. Kaleido Plus on, got a, it. on a 10 inch device. So, I mean, 
color is great, but I mean, we've never seen it on 13.3, so Fujitsu will be likely the first person to market with a 13.3. It, it remains to yeah. be seen, like, with if Onyx announces anything. So, speaking of Onyx, they've released three new devices. Uh, yeah. The Tab uh, Ultra, the Nova Air 2, and the Leaf 2. Let's talk about the tab first because this is probably the most exciting one. Mm -hmm. It's probably in the English international market. It's like the first true like e-paper tablet. And so it's going to be providing an experience that we've not really seen before in the English market. Onyx has gradually refined their tab series in China uh, over the course of the past you know, year in 2022, they've released like three different tab models and they've really said that they are increasing the like performance and refresh rate. So this experience will be like any, like, like unlike any other, it's using, you know, um, a new Qualcomm processor, you know, a 6,700 milliamp battery, Jeez. 227 PPI. Right. It's like 128 gigs of memory. Um, that's insane. The battery alone, man. Yeah, Android 11, Google Play. Um, so it, I mean, it's looking good. Uh, the Leaf 2 uh, is something that I'm personally excited about. And yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've gotten a lot of pre-orders on it so far. Yeah, that's uh, I don't really check this store much. I know that's uh, another department of ours, but um, yeah, it's I, I know that like you know word around the the water cooler and the coffee pot <laughs> has been like you know it's been good sell good sales. So yeah, yeah. So I guess the one compelling thing about this is that it has it's a, it, it's undergone a tremendous redesign from the first generation Leaf um, in order to get page turns buttons you needed a case with page yeah. turns this is oh, actually yeah, right. page turn buttons are built right into this that's right they had that magnet case with the uh the little rail <clears throat> yeah um so this is using um so what's the difference between the leaf and the leaf 2 well this one is using a card at 1200 screen um this one is manual page turn buttons and 300 ppi uh, the RAM and the storage is pretty consistent across each generations, including like the dual speakers, built-in microphone, G sensor for automatic like rotation. But what's new about this is that there's two colors, uh, both black and white, but it doesn't stop there. So they have both an option based on the color that you want to be so the black is like a flush screen and bezel design. So it's protected by like a, a layer of glass. Whereas the white one actually has a sunken screen and bezel design with no layer of glass. So not only are they offering two different colors, but two different, different experiences when it comes to like the overall aesthetics. I mean, some people really like sunken screen and, and, and bezel designs, me included because um, if you have overhead lighting, if you're reading outdoors, there's no glare because it's just being absorbed by the e-paper display. Whereas if you have a, a glass-based display, you know, overhead lighting will reflect. If you're in direct sunlight, sunlight will reflect off of the glass. So, um, you know, a lot of people just read indoors. They're not reading outdoors a lot with the e-readers. So that's, you know, it's, a, it's up to the, the person, I guess, right? I hope that was intentional i hope it wasn't a manufacturing problem or a delay or a shortage where they're like oh man we ran out of flush screens because if that's the case they it, it, in our history of 13 years this will have been the only company to ever do that to give you four uh, sorry two physical construction differences with the same release product we've never seen that we've seen advancements like the kindle paperwhite and the paperwhite 5 you know like they go from sunken screen to flush screen and things like that but no one has ever had the same device being released with two physical tooled setups no one has done that that's going to be crazy yeah so i'm very interested in, in in reviewing that so the final device that i think is a little bit underwhelming is the nova air 2 
Yeah, that was like, eh. Yeah, it's... It just seems like it's like the Nova Air 1. You know, uh, with a... Instead of Android 10, it's running Android 11. You, and, know. you know, in the past, that, that's the only way these guys are able to upgrade Android. I mean, look at every manufacturer, man. That's like the only way. Me Book does it. Big Me does it. It's like, oh, we can't put Android on it. Let's just release a plus version or like a, an X version. It's really the only way they can do it. Ian, I, I mean, Onyx never confirmed with us. Like, I asked them, but they never, yeah. like, replied. Some people are saying that it's using Ian Carta HD. But some oh. people have spoken to Inc. Uh, I mean, to Onyx customer service, and they're saying that it's using Card at twelve hundred. Oh well, we're gonna have to wait and see when we get our samplos. That's gonna be interesting. Yeah. So. But yeah, I, I would I would agree that was out of the releases that would be the the most underwhelming because the the two physical choices between flush screen and and um and sunken screen is cool. The uh, the amount of peripherals that like the Tab Ultra is getting, like the keyboard snap, uh, the upgraded pen. We don't know what kind of pen they're using because Onyx has traditionally been kind of flip floppy with pens, but um it's it's looking like a good release uh, batch and you know a much needed refresh. When it comes to buying ebooks, we we spend the money and we buy them and we can read them, delete them off our, you know, unit and most of the time they're they're held in cloud storage to be able to be downloaded at a later date. Kobo unveiled, you know, some sort of like rewards program uh, numerous years ago where you earn credits for each purchase that you do and then those credits can be redeemed for books but you really have to spend thousands of dollars in order to just get a free book. Amazon has just unveiled a new program in the US called Kindle Rewards and it is currently in invite only and in beta. Uh, the spirit behind the initiative is to reward people who buy digital books or print books and earn rewards on each purchases. Users can earn five points on Kindle books and two points on print books. Once enough points have been accrued, they can be redeemed for ebook credit. So basically, you need 300 points to redeem $3 in ebook credit. And this credit is applied to your Amazon account, which you, you could be used to, you know, subsidize the purchase of a future book. So the average ebook costs around $12.50. So you'll get about 59 cents in credit back. You would have bought the book anyways, and this way you earn points with it. So Amazon did not, I mean, sort of, Amazon did dis disclose to us that it will be running limited time promotions where you can earn back two times the points on digital or print purchases. However, they don't, did not state when they would do it. So this is a free program, doesn't cost anything to participate. It only applies to print and digital books and does not apply to audiobooks, comics, or manga. So it's like invite only, so I couldn't even like see the page, but I've seen like screenshots on like Reddit on like what it looked like and stuff. And a lot of people who are US readers that read a lot, they never received the invite, but they went to like the link that we posted, which will be on um, on our website for this podcast. And you will be able to actually see it and see if you've been approved or not. Um, I, I, that's cool. Uh, I kind of feel like they're, you know, they're, they're doing it in a way where it's like they're trying to reward you for buying. You said it applies to print as well? Yeah. You can redeem for print or you can get rewards if you buy print. So you can, you, it's basically, you get more points if you buy the ebook. But you oh, get, okay. you, oh, there it is. But yeah. you get like less points if you buy okay. the print book. So yeah, because they obviously want you to buy the ecologically friendly thing more than the one that hurts the environment. You know, you need trucks to move the books around, whereas, uh, you know, digital is instant. It just delivers to your device. You don't have to move. You don't have to use gas. You don't have to use energy or resources. I obviously know that electronics take power, but far less than hauling gigantic trucks down the highway for an 18 hours filled with books well i think it's because you you look at the ratio of points 
probably on that Amazon too. more people buy print than they buy ebooks. Yeah, yeah. So this is a way so that trying to change it. Exactly. So yeah. it, the more ebooks that you that you buy, the more points that you earn, the more credit you get back. So it, it's just a, you know, obviously it's skewed probably at a at a, you know five points for the kindle books two points for print books i don't yeah. know what the ratio is between those two i'm not good at right. math but no and you'd have to check out the amount of sales based on which one and you know cross-reference it with the point you know rebate and all that stuff but i understand what you're saying yeah that, that i think that's that's smart it encourages it also encourages to people to stimulate the economy and buy more crap it really does yeah i mean so let's look at this it's it all comes down to like numbers so yeah in july of 2022 in the united states ebook revenue is on a decline revenue was down 6.6 .6 for the amount like 6.6 .6 percent of the amount but it's basically the format generated 82 million in one month mm -hmm. but in terms of um like print books uh it generated 177 million for wow. hardcovers and 273 yeah. million for paperbacks. So 82 million for ebooks. Yeah. 177 million for hardcovers and 273 yeah. million for paperbacks. And in just one month in July. <laughs> so that, that's crazy. That's like the sort of the last, you know, that's the latest month that we have statistics yeah. for because it usually comes back a few months because you know everyone all the publishers have to sort of report to the yeah, american yeah. publishers association mm. about what gets sold where so yeah. but i mean you know you look at those figures it's like print for hardcovers or paperbacks together is like quadruple to 10 times more than what ebooks are so isn't that insane yes wow. so as much as we talk about ebooks it's not the most popular format out there um no i mean there <laughs> i mean you know obviously it's our industry we know those numbers but at the same point when you really break it down and verbally say it out loud i mean that's a staggering difference you know um there is not enough people buying digital but i, I kind of understand it. i mean when it comes to games too i mean i i like buying physical games uh more than i do digital but um yeah i, I understand yeah that's pretty crazy that's a pretty big difference let's talk about the kindle basic oh man the whole kindle lineup man uh kindle basic came in two colors which i can't remember the last time that happened on the basic line uh, correct me if i'm wrong i don't think the basic line has ever had two colors the paper white had white with the manga model um the uh uh the original kindle keyboard had white and gray uh the oasis had uh rose gold and gunmetal i don't think the basic line has ever had color choices yeah i don't remember i know the yeah. paper whites have always had multiple colors available that's right so this one has denim so the the and you know people might be saying you know get to the e-reader but this is important the ecological benefits of it is important because that's what they're advertising that's what kobo's advertising that's what kindle's advertising a lot of people have made the shift you know hisense and xiaomi and and all these guys have made the shift from plastics to wax papers and cardboards so uh kindle is spouting 75 percent recycled plastics which is still 10 percent less than the kobo which they're obviously competing with but the denim to get the blue tinge, they couldn't use all recyclables. They actually had to use a nice fresh spool of blue number seven to mix in there. So you only get a 30% recycled body. But they're using 90% recycled magnesium for the PCB, which is the printed circuit board, you know, the computer chips. So that's really cool how they're using recycled metals, recycled bottles into the body of the unit. I think that's cool. And that's important because Earth's resources are not infinite. They, they are finite. So the more stuff you use out of rocks and trees, you know, it's they're going to go away. So uh, anyways, it's really cool. But there was a massive problem with the basic in that if you look at the comments, you look at everything, everyone's saying like, that's just a paperweight three. <laughs> and it's true. We're slowly seeing the basic line step over its territory into the paperweight, which I believe is one of the reasons the paperweight jumped to 6.8. Because if the paperweight wasn't 6.8 inches, there'd almost be no reason to spend the money to buy a paperweight when the basic does everything it's got a glow light it's got bluetooth it's got wireless audio it's got uh 300 ppi so like why would you buy a paperweight the screen size 
the storage options. So they're giving you reasons to buy it because it started to overlap to a point where it's just becoming the same thing, which was a very obvious observation both us and our users and our viewers were making so yeah it was kind of funny yeah this is the most storage ever found on like 16. a basic model i mean That's when the 10th generation basic came out it only had four gigs of internal storage yeah. and then about a year later they quietly doubled it to eight gigs yeah. so right. the kindle basic has more storage than the paper white does at eight gigabytes You're right. for that model. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's why they released the 16 gig variant because the basic even has more storage. Oh my God. So, I mean, the basic in the US is like $99, whereas, like, you know, the Kindle paper white 16 gigs is about like $139, $149. Yeah. So, mm. I've never been able to recommend the basic before, mainly because of the sub True. 300 PPI screen. I mean, I think it had. 227 or 212 ppi 12 i think yeah yeah so the 10th generation had and previous generations all, all always had like sub 300 ppi displays and whether you're a casual reader that reads a book off and on over the course of a month or you read like a book a week or a couple books a week um you know screen resolution is important um yes it is i mean we notice it more pronounced because we do a lot of side by side comparisons in our uh news publication as well as our youtube channel so yes. whenever a new device comes out we always compare it to the previous generation and we compete it to like uh, uh other you know other devices that are similarly priced you know such as uh kobo's or barnes and nobles so um you know so on and so forth so we notice more because we see the previous generation and the new generation side by side in yeah. the studio and how it comes across in, in video is different from our eyes in real life because like our eyes could just see so much better than video and compression and things like that like actually see for your eyes on a computer screen or a phone or a tablet but 300 ppi really makes a huge difference when reading for instance the fonts are less fuzzy they're more like sharp so, you know, I've never been able to recommend a basic before, but I can recommend this 11th generation entry level Kindle or all new Kindle. So. so, you know, for people who are looking to buy themselves an upgrade from like an older Kindle, like it's surprising when I, I don't take public transit a lot. Like I don't drive. So I, yeah. I'm always <clears> like <throat> cabs, Ubers, sometimes the bus, like if I'm like just going like a, like. 10 or 12 blocks away and i yeah. just don't feel like walking because it's raining i see a lot of kindles on the bus but i see a lot of old kindles on the bus like you know <laughs> like kindle keyboards like kindle keyboards yeah. i see those all the time or kindle touches i see yeah. a lot of really old kindles so if you're the type of person that's like rocking an old e-reader I think upgrading to the new Kindle for like $99, plus you can trade in your old Kindle and save some money on that as well. This will be night and day, your old Kindle versus like this new Kindle. I just agree. in regard, not even just regards to like the screen tech, <laughs> but being able to adjust the, fr having a light so you can read at night and you don't need a reading light or over overhead light. You can, there's just a light built into the Kindle that yeah. doesn't shine into your eyes. It just projects light evenly across the screen. So it's not like reading, uh, looking at your smartphone or tablet at night where light's shining into your eyes and suppressing melatonin. This is the opposite of that. So if you're the type of person that likes to read at night as you're falling asleep, you will be able to enjoy it way more. You know, uh, I get asked uh, off of, uh, in relation to this, I get asked a lot, like, do you use an e-ink phone and an e-ink watch and e-ink computer screen? And I'm like, no, man, like I love e-ink. It's, it's, our, it's our industry e-paper, but no, I don't have all these e-paper devices laying around that I use, but I have been shifting the last 12 months, no joke. To before I go to bed, I actually just use one of the ones in the office, an A7CC uh, large screen color e ink phone, just with Wi Fi to browse stuff, you know, to like to look Wikipedia, to look on, you know, people's, you know, social media stories and stuff. Because I find like, you know, when you have a phone in front of your face before you go to bed for an hour, if you didn't have 
media on the phone, it would be the same as you holding a flashlight in your eyes for a straight hour. The only reason we don't notice it is because we're engaged by the pixels changing on the screen. So I was just step back of, uh, beside myself and I'm like, I'm just shining a light in my face for hours on end before I go to sleep. And I didn't like that. So I've been like gravitating towards like using uh, higher refresh e-paper products before I go to sleep. And I feel way better about it, honestly. You turn like uh, the warm light on, on an A7CC in color with like X mode or like, you know, speed mode, it's, it's quite nice. Well, yeah. sometimes it's hard to get around you know, uh, there's e ink watches, so you don't yeah. have to look at like OLED watches or Pixel watches or Apple yep. watches. You know, you can get like um, a Fossil watch or a Sony yeah. Fez watch. Those are like the most popular. But when it comes to computer monitors, sure, you can buy like an, an e ink, like, you know, monitor, but they yeah. cost between like $1,500 for like a, like a, you know, uh, say like $900 for a 13.3, which is too small yeah. for a monitor. If you want like a 25 inch, you're spending between 2,500 and 3,500. And um, you're, you're either using like the Dasung 253 or the Onyx Book Mira Pro. And those don't really get a lot of media attention. A lot of people don't even think that they exist. You know, um, Das Sung and, and Onyx Books, they're hardly household names. Yeah. However, Philips is a household name and they have just developed uh, and released a new product that is very different from, you know, uh, from devices that have been announced in the past. So it blends the both worlds of a traditional LCD monitor as well as an e-ink display. The two-in-one uh, monitor um, has a 23-inch LCD monitor and there's an e-ink panel that's 13.3 <laughs> that's built yeah. right into it. But the, what's interesting is that, you know, for the, um, the color monitor, you actually get pretty solid it's like a uh like a like a, a 1080p like monitor basically yeah. um 99 of the srgb color coverage um it's pretty good i think what is interesting about this is the e-ink panel is 13.3 it has 150 ppi it's you know, uh, 1200 by 1600. Yeah. It comes with both a frontlet display and color temperature system. There you go. And there you, can, you go. And it's not just like rigid. You can tilt it 45 degrees like the e-ink like monitor. So if you want to like tilt it like for for whatever reason, you can tilt it back and you can tilt it forward. So you could, you know, it's not as rigid and locked in place, which is really nice. So with this, it's like you don't have to make the decision to use an e-ink monitor as your primary display or have two different monitors like on your computer like table, one e-ink and then one, um, you know, and your LCD, your full color one. This gives you the best of both worlds, which no one's ever done before. Um, Philips is selling it for like, you know, you can get it from our store for about like fourteen hundred, so it's still a little bit expensive. But oh, but dude, not compared to the the Dasung and the um, uh, the Onyx right now. And with those guys, it's only you know not not trashing them, but it's rather expensive. The Dasung and the Onyx, and um, it's uh, it's only e ink, so you don't get that option. You don't get that escape. To like okay i'm just gonna use lcd for the next couple of hours and then i'll use the ink before i go to bed the phillips you can do both yeah so i mean um you can extend the screen on both devices you can have something on the e ink display and something else different so think yeah. of it as like a multi multi-screen device which we've never seen before so nope i nope. i wanted to mention this because it comes from a name everyone heard of like i have phillips shavers you know i have phillips men grooming like grooming stuff so i mean when it comes to phillips i think phillips makes some pretty good tech <laughs> you know you know what they didn't make what you know what they didn't make that was good man you're talking about all these cool things like i got the shaver it's so high quality you know what i had i had the phillips cdi with hotel mario anybody remember that <laughs> the failed mario game 
And one of the only times Mario was outside of the Nintendo brand was in 94 from 95. They had the Philips CDI. It was just garbage console. That was funny. No, Philips is really good. That was a one-off um, anomaly. But yeah, they make some really good stuff. All right. So last but not least, let's look ahead if we might into our crystal ball yeah. and look at what's going to happen to 2023. So the digital note in industry uh, running ink technology is starting to get hyper competitive in 2022 and we'll go into yep. overdrive in 2023. Mm -hmm. We now have more choices than ever before when picking a trusted brand and sticking with it for the long haul. Onyx Book has been one of the undisputed leader in eNotes and has an extensive portfolio of about 30 to 40 products released in the past five or six years, but they never had much competition, but they do now. So Remarkable built up a brand from scratch and invests a ton of it into marketing and social media. They, most people have heard of Remarkable, whereas they might not have heard about Onyx because Onyx yeah. doesn't really do uh, advertising and social media channels. They sort of rely on YouTube reviews and the odd like blog review. Yeah. So Big Me has become an emerging player in the industry and has built a very strong brand. They are not afraid to take risks with color e-paper and have developed an entirely new device that is employing Gallery 3 called the Galley. Um, and they've also partnered with us for the um, ink note color. So, you know, Big Me has never been afraid about taking risks, releasing large screen devices that are e-notes, and having a cult following. Uh, Fujitsu has made a couple of generations of A4 and A5 e-notes, primarily marketed in Japan, but they do have English and have been very popular in international markets. Um, you know, you have Lenovo that just released the Yoga Paper, Huawei releasing the MatePad, uh, you look at, um, you know, other brands, you know, uh, dude, dude, the Kindle scribe. Yeah. I mean, sharp Fujitsu, oh, Amazon yeah. with the scribe, Kobo with the Ellipsa, mm -hmm. Lenovo and Huawei getting involved in, uh, e e paper devices for the first time. I mean, yeah. these are big, well-known companies. I think yeah. a lot of people buying e-notes for the first time are going to buy from one of these big companies because they can trust them more than who's heard of Boyu, you know what nah, I mean? No one. And, and no that's one. why, you know, the company went bankrupt and they're not heard from again. Who's heard yeah. from Super Notes? Like, you oh, know. Super Notes off the, off the radar. Yeah, I mean, they don't yeah. even go to uh, screen tech conventions in their own country where they're, no. you know, so they don't go, they don't go to events or anymore. They're just like comfortable selling like a couple units a month, but yeah, they're on the brink of bankruptcy for sure. But I mean, I feel bad for the smaller companies in the e-reader space that are not well known that will probably continue like to lose market share. Yeah, you know, dude, there's so many players. I'm not going to go over the ones you just said, but, you know, that's actually been something that's been emerging from our viewers and our users that have been saying, like, they're like, guys, there's too many options. And I'm like, no, no. I mean, there's only 39 brands. <laughs> there's a lot of options. We haven't even talked about Hanvon on this massive comeback. Hanvon's been in the game. They made color before almost anyone. They've had this crazy like decade-long track record and they've come back with the n10 the n10 mini a bunch of e-readers they're a full line manufacturer and they're in english now i would be safe to say that hanvon has surpassed boyu slash me book in terms of their lineup the 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 identity the capabilities because a boyu me book has kind of been slowly just in this stasis mode, if anything, on this downward decline, whereas companies like Hanvon and Hisense is releasing just tons of stuff. The High Reader, the Touch, the A9, Xiaomi's been releasing a whole bunch of things all in English. And it's like, we're starting to see iReader iReader has a crazy line. They've made pens for other companies like Onyx. They make the tips for Remarkable. They white label their things out. They're making English stuff in uh, November this month. There are so many players that have either come out of nowhere or like have finally emerged from this long gestational period. It's 
it, it's overwhelming even for us it's like wow look at all the, we're just getting these samples and samples and samples and you know it, it's just so much stuff it's insane it's to a totally different game than what it was six years ago yeah i mean it's sometimes it's too overwhelming to like report on yeah. all the new e-readers that come out because there's so many that have come out you know like hanmon three new models that, like in the past two months uh yeah. howey is going to be doing like a smaller version of the made paper like iReader every couple months releases a new product uh xiaomi has done like a few like uh, sort of mini e-readers with like, um, you know, I don't know. They they they've done like the ink palms. The ink palm and the the they had they had a W7 note, uh, which was um which was decent, but didn't really you know gain traction. So you know that's the big trend of the e-note industry has been traditional Chinese companies that have only focused on that specific market are now loading English on their models and trying to expand their distribution outside of China. So yeah. whereas some models like Onyx, you know, at least in 2022, they've released more models for the, exclusively for the Chinese market than they've released to like the international market. That's right. So they're almost doing the exact opposite of what all their competition is like doing in China. Whereas like they seem to be like retreating back to China. Not to say that, you know, and I, I think partly it's because of all the competition from all these new brands. That's um, right. Chinese traditional brands that used to just do it uh, like Chinese now they're doing English in addition to Chinese you know there's all these like new brands emerging um, you know Amazon has been synonymous with e-readers they popularized the entire industry the Kindle remains one of the most like beloved e-readers in the world everyone has heard of the Kindle um, you know when they announced the scribe which was a 10 inch e-note with a 300 ppi screen which is unheard of oh that's insane right there i don't i don't think you guys can understand that wait till it comes out <laughs> yeah and i mean it retails for 350 the like the remarkable double the price most onyx devices for 10 inch e-notes double the price um you know even the ellipsa is more expensive than that you know you even look at uh what onyx is doing in 2022 where they released like the tab ultra the leaf 2 uh the, yeah. the nova air 2 yeah i mean yeah. they're almost expensive or more than the scribe which is 350 i mean that's gonna be a huge sea change in the industry and you can obviously feel comfortable about buying this from Amazon because of just the engineering power that they have yeah, they're, true. they're going to be releasing firmware updates up the yin yang on this and and they have accounts you know you can link your account from purchase you can return it if you don't want it you get prime same day shipping there's so many reasons to buy it just as a and I, you know I don't know anything about cooking or hairstyles but like as a blind consumer to say I want to get into e-note oh look amazon scribe cool it, it and i'm not bashing that but it's true they have that they have that power to harness that type of person that wants to buy it it's so easy and seamless and streamlined and there it is in your hands same day in an amazon box while you bought your dish soap and your your pack of tissues you know what i mean it's it's all there all the pieces are there and it's they got it. They've completed the puzzle and it's going to be in your hands and it's going to be good. And I mean, there's probably no other trusted brand in the world as Kobo. You know, they've been True. in the e-reader space since 2010. Uh, they've primarily focused on a couple of new e-readers every single year. Yeah. They firmware su updates. They support e-readers made like 10 or 15 years ago. You know, <laughs> they, they, they just don't like issue updates for like the latest generation shit they do like all sorts of old stuff so i mean you know they're not afraid to support gen 1 devices because they know people are still using them so kobo released this ellipsa and the sage which both also have digital note taking capabilities yeah so the ellipsa is like a like a, a large screen 
dedicated eNote device, whereas the Sage, it's like a hybrid e-reader slash eNote. It doesn't even come with a stylus. You have to buy it extra. So for people who want to take notes, you can. For people who just want a larger screen device to read digital content, you know, you can do yeah. that too. So, I mean, both Kobo and Amazon, traditionally e-reader companies, now getting into eNotes. And that's probably affected market share for some of these smaller companies that used to be financially viable because there wasn't a really a lot of people around selling e-notes now in 2022 and looking at 2023 with e-notes you, you know no longer just using black and white displays for 10 and uh, 13 13.3 inch devices but now we're seeing collider 3 gallery 3 we're, we're seeing all these like alternatives that are just um coming up i'm actually writing a story right now about clear ink uh, nice. They've been out of the news for the past couple of years since the company was sold to a series of Chinese investors. Many industry al analysts thought the company was dead and the screen technology was never going to see like a, a commercial release. But they have just uh, announced like a 454 PPI screen that they're demoing off and uh, they're going to be using that same like high resolution screen and a color yeah. one. So I actually saw a video and I've been talking to the CEO. So I'm actually writing a story on that right now. And cool. other breaking news. Um, I just got this just now. You know how um, Penguin Random House wanted to acquire Simon & Schuster? Uh, okay, sure. So Simon & Schuster is like probably the third largest publishing company in the world. And Penguin Random House is like number one. So they wanted to like buy them uh, for like a couple billion. But uh, a judge in the, at, you know, at the Department of Justice, they're actually blocking the deal. Oh. So the deal looked like it may not go through. So when a company, like when a huge company wants to buy another co huge company involved in the same like industry, what happens is that there's antitrust concerns where like, you know, one company would be too powerful. Um, it, well, they never stopped Disney. Well, <laughs> what do you got to say about that? So, I mean, like, <laughs> I mean, that was approved because it's like, you know, Marvel and Disney uh, with Pixar and stuff like that. Star Wars. Um, That's a lot of properties, man. You got to admit. Yeah, That's a lot. but a lot of them that they bought, like, weren't publicly traded companies. Like, okay, Lucasfilms yeah, yeah. wasn't really a publicly traded company. It was like a private one. Okay. Whereas, like, it, yeah. um you know the the publishing industry at least in the english world is very small you have like harper collins hachette simon and schuster and penguin random house and you know a lot of people wanted to buy simon and schuster but in order for that deal to go through because simon and schuster they they publish books in the uk so it has to be approved by uk authorities they publish united states they need to be you know united states authorities have to sign off on like the merger so but the united states did not sign off on the merger they decided to block it so here's the quote we strongly disagree with today's decision, which is an unfortunate setback for readers and authors, and we will immediately request an expedited appeal. As we demonstrated throughout the trial, the Department of Joke Justice's focus on advances to the world's best paid authors instead of consumers or the intense competitiveness in the publishing sector runs contrary to its mission to fair competition. We believe this merger will be pro-competitive and we will continue to work closely with Paramount and Simon & Schuster on next steps. So it's like, they're basically gonna like appeal the, you know, to see if anybody could like, you know, the Supreme Court can heal yeah. it, you know, or the, the higher courts or whatever. So this isn't the end of it, but this looks pretty definitive that, you know, the deal probably won't go through. Yeah, um, I mean, that is, uh, you can't have one person own everything. 
I mean, you just, you can't, especially when it comes to the big companies. I mean, weirdly enough, the thing that sustains human life, food, is another thing because I think 10 companies own literally every piece of food we eat. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, you know, something that we used to focus on a lot at Goody Reader when there was a lull in the releases of devices was digital publishing. I mean, Mike and I personally went to like digital publishing events in New York and like Chicago and all these places. Um, yeah, Book when Expo there was, like, America, the American yeah. Library Association. We went to like... When there was only like two e-readers in the world. Yeah. 2013, 14, 15, when there was nothing. Yeah, man, we were like, let's do digital publishing and tablets. And you know, we, we kept alive, but yeah, we, we most certainly have no time for that nowadays. Yeah, I mean, I can, you know, we talk about sort of like the monthly you know how much the how many ebooks were sold in a given month and then, yeah, we, yeah. then we look at you know over the like the last eight months this is how many ebooks were sold this is how right. many audiobooks were sold this is how right. many print titles were sold because uh i i like to follow the industry like both print and digital from like oh no you have to you for know sure. at least from like a monthly point of view but like yeah i no longer report on like you know, in Q3 2022, HarperCollins made this much money and this, and you know, 8% of their total revenues were like ebook sales and audiobook sales. You know, this is the titles that's, you know, that were the most paid for. You know, I don't report on that stuff anymore because, it, it, you know, all the articles got views, but they got like zero comments. So I kind of like report just more on e-readers and like screen tech now. Yeah. Because that, I mean, there's so much coming out like on a, like a daily or weekly or monthly basis that's like there's really no slowing down yeah dude i mean like we get people all the time that are always like oh you're just reporting on amazon because it makes more money for you and we're like well yeah we're a business so we do the research and do the do the work to give you a proper uh you know article or video surrounding something you guys want to hear of course we as a company need to make money and we need to give you guys what you want. Do you want to see a triple camera setup with four days of production work into a Tolino? Not to bash Tolino, but would you rather see the Kindle Basic? It, it, it's you got to give the people what they ask for or they're just not going to be interested. So we need to respect you guys as the viewers and as the listeners and as our users to hey we want more kindle it's like sure we'd love to do the work and do the time and do the research to give you that because that's what you want to see and that's what we need to do as a company yeah i mean you know looking at it the kindle is the most popular e-reader in the world it's the most popular and like more people have questions about it than there are answers available online so yeah. we film a bunch of mini tutorials like how do you, you know, if you're a parent and the kid uses the same e-reader, but they don't have a kid's e-reader, how can you make it so they won't like buy a bunch of books or surf That's the internet right. or, you know, we tell you how to like a, a underrated feature that a lot of people aren't aware of on every Kindle model are parental controls. So we teach you how to do it. You know, um, yeah. we, we mainly show you things that aren't intuitive that the average user that has a Kindle might not know about. You know? And you know what? Almost I even forgot about it that like we did a video on it and everyone's like, oh yeah, I didn't even remember. I think I remembered like years ago, but Amazon Kindles have flashcards. It's built into like a triple deep dive menu. You can get to flashcards. And I was just like, oh yeah, I, I think I, I vaguely remember something on this. And people were like, you should do a video on it. We're like, yeah, okay. And we did a video on flashcards and it was really interesting. Hey, yeah, so I mean, we mix those videos up with like reviews. Like I'm still, oh, sure. still have to do like a fossil gen three, six. Oh, what a cool review. watch, man. Like, you should get on that, you and your guys, man, because I think our team sent you all the photos and everything. It's a cool watch. It's really nice. I'm not going to dwell on it right now because you can watch the video, but it's the most non-looking smart watch that is a smart watch I've ever seen. It doesn't look like a big square block with like a, 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 a you know, like a curved screen and like a, a just a glass square. It, it's very much like a non smart watch. Yeah. But it's a smart watch. So it's, it's cool. like I'm writing about clearing right now, which yeah. hasn't been in the news. So I'm giving people an update on that. Uh, 
Reedy, Reedy Corporation, R I D I, Korea's okay. number one ebook provider, oh, just yeah. released the Read a Paper 4 uh, yes. just now. So it's like 231 <laughs> US, like US dollars. It's pretty well the most popular, like, you know, reading brand in South yeah. Korea. And it's like, okay, I gotta write about this because this just came out. It's like, it's just non stop. And it's like, know. you know, so many different devices that. From so many different countries, that it's like it's sort of hard to stop because it's well, like. Well, be between you and me and everyone, right now, Mike, uh, the Han Vaughn stuff is on route. Uh, the Philips, I just got word back from them that they're going to send us a sample. We got the Han Vaughn N10 Mini sending us a sample. I mean, Onyx is going to come out in a little bit. I mean, we're uh, us here at the studio are going to be sending you guys a lot of media, a lot of videos, a lot of, you know, uh... thoughts. Yeah. It's a lot, man. Yeah, I mean, you know, it just in this episode today, we pretty well focused on all new devices. Oh, I'm not even talking about everything in the background, man. We didn't even talk about the Tolino Shine. We didn't talk about like the uh, what came out this month, even like the Dasung A4 came out this month. Um, the Shine 4, the we barely touched the Fossil. I mean, there's just there's too much, you know. We're we're just talking here, Mike and myself. But uh, yeah, you guys should watch the videos on our our channel, read the articles. We cover everything, and um, you know, it's interesting to see just where the industry's going. That you know what I think it is, honestly. Like you know, we do this every day. I get all the products every day. The biggest shift I saw in the e-reader industry in the last seven years was when boy you fell and big me rose that was the, the 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 biggest shift that before it was the big three barnes and noble amazon kobo that's it and then there was onyx and 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 boy you with the the mimas yeah that, that was it was like, like the was rise like, of e-notes that was it once onyx capitalized on just being the best because they, they they are in terms of e-paper tablets they are and were and once me book uh boy you fell and they took a two years off basically to get their crap together and big me came out just open the floodgates man it's like that scene from uh end game where they go through the portal and all of thanos's troops come through it's like Han Vaughn and Zaomi and Hisense and Eye Reader and Pumera and Mudita and King Jim and Fossil and Scoggin and Kroki. I, I can't even name them all. And just like, Avengers Assemble, man. It's just everyone came out. And now Meebook's like, okay, guys, we got our stuff back. Oh, there's a lot of people here <laughs> looking around. And they're like, holy crap. And it is even better to argue that High Read which is using old Boyu products, is doing a better job now than MeBook making their own things. You know what I mean, man? It's just like the landscape has done a 180 and everyone's in the mix. It's all, everything's in the mix, y'all. All it's, right. There's so much stuff and uh, I'm, I'm running out of brain. <laughs> yeah, so we'll wrap today's show off. Thanks everyone for listening. You'll be able to listen to this podcast both on our website, goodyreader.com, where we publish four to six stories every single day. You can check out our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash goodyreader for all the latest unboxings, news, previews, and uh, device comparisons. And of course, this podcast is available on Google Podcasts, uh, yeah. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and uh, all of your other favorite uh, distribution methods. So thanks for listening. And we will be doing a show on podcast podcasts every month and kind of give you an, a you know an overview of what's transpired over the last month of note as well as breaking news so thanks for listening and for goody reader my name is michael and this is peter everybody take care